All right, Atlanta, it is your turn. That's right, EYL Takeover. We coming to Atlanta, y'all. Yes, uh, January 25th, January 26th, two-day event. We have starting out January 25th, live podcast. We have PTG boys. Yeah. Um, they're killing the car industry right now. Brandon Medford, uh, EYL alumni, alumni, and his two partners will be there. Mr. and Mrs. two weeks out. Killing the fitness game in Atlanta. Power couple. Um, yeah, the first couple of Atlanta. They will be guests. None other than the, one of the top realtors in Atlanta, Kiana Watson, top 5% realtor in Atlanta, will be there to talk about Atlanta real estate. And <laughs> also, the legend himself, curator Kenny Burns, of curator of culture, Kenny Burns, EYO alumni, will be our guest. We'll have other alumni in the building. We will have following the live podcast. It's an open bar, private dinner, private networking event. It's going to be crazy. That's just day one. Day two, we have a workshop plan for you guys we have alex good energy the king of trucking eyl alumni we have andy from y2k credit solutions yeah, credit talk about credit around me. eyl alumni mg the mortgage guy eyl alumni will be in the building to talk about real estate for fi financing your real estate deal yep. and then also the king of wholesaling max maxwell and eyl alumni himself the will legend. be in there to teach real estate wholesaling so two-day event all the information is on our website and over now don't don't wait till it's too late. Get your tickets. Atlanta, we will see you soon. Can't wait to touch the town. That's right. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Go on to earnyourleisure.com right now. Hit events tab. We'll see you there. All right, guys. Welcome back. EYL, Maryland edition. Yeah, DC, DC edition, DC, actually. DC. Yeah, shout out to see DC. Nevada. Shout out to the District of Columbia for sure. So before we start, um, we just got to thank... You guys, we had a crazy event uh, this morning, yeah. and um, you also had a crazy event as well. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about that I for sure. Yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we had a crazy, crazy event. Uh, day two will be tomorrow. Well, by the time you hit it, it'll be over. But the DC weekend, DMV weekend, was yeah. a tremendous success. In Atlanta, we coming next. That's yeah. our next stop. Um, January twenty fifth and January twenty sixth, we headed to the A. We on our way. We gonna do it big out there for the whole yeah. weekend. Big, so the big shout out to. Uh, Capital uh, Events Group, man. Chirani, uh, Chirani, Chirani, uh, Hydera, man. He did an amazing job putting that together. Mm. Um, so definitely shout out to him, man. If you're in the D.C. area and you need an event plan, hit my man up, man. Nah, shout nah, out to nah. the most, the most important person. Yeah, for man. sure. That's that's a fact. That's a fact. So, all right. Um, I'm excited about this episode for a few different reasons. A lot of people, they always tag us like who they want to see. Man, and, listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, so I copyrighted we, that. We, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We, we, we try to accommodate as much as we possibly can. So, Kezia Williams, uh, if you if you don't know, she's the CEO of Black Upstart, and um, yeah, she has that signature. Man, listen. Man, you know, listen. Yeah. You gotta drag it out, but man, it's like, listen. There's like seven A's and then the N. There's right? like three N's and then like another five N's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, she's really dope. She um she's a big proponent of financial literacy. Yeah. She's a big proponent of um entrepreneurship. Always. Yeah, definitely in our community. Yeah, too. and teaching, yeah. teaching entrepreneurship. She has a, a whole program. We're gonna talk about that. Um so <coughs> one of the things I like about her, like if you follow her Instagram page, is that she always like posts like these Twitter um posts that she puts up and it's like seven different ones so you always got to go to the next <laughs> one but it's like real life you gotta slide to the yeah, 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 left, slide to left. <laughs> slide to the left hey, that's a slide fact right, hey. but, but, but it's real life common sense stuff that people can use and a lot of times people they've been asking us like you know we love all of this high finance and stuff like this but how do I pick my 401k or like how do I budget proper how do I start a business so these are all things that she posts like on a daily basis on Instagram and I'm sure all other social media outlets as well. I follow her on Instagram. And um, also with, with her company, The Black Upstart, they help people start businesses. Yeah. Like they give them the fundamentals of how to start a business. Yeah. So And employ people. Like that's one of the things like yes. we have a lot of entrepreneurs, but how many can employ people? I, I think yeah, I that's that. that's commendable. That, yes, you that taking you, all my talking points. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it though. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's commendable. So, yes. so all right. So, first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Congratulations to you both on oh, your event today. Thank you, thank like, you, thank I thank saw you. the Instagram stories and it was like people upon people, all this black excellence. In yeah, one yeah. So, we had two of you. You had an event, Black Upstar had an event, <laughs> and then Earn Your Leisure had an event. We didn't know we was having events until right. mm -hmm. the events was already set, but we had events at the same time time pretty yeah. much uh -huh. <laughs> same but, day, it was, same time. but literally <laughs> but it was dope you know that's just that's just 
that's just that just means that the energy is out there. Yeah. Yes. And um, you know, it, yes. it, it's the time for, for, for financial literacy and entrepreneurship. One hundred percent. And our, yes. the community's already, man. So mm-hmm. that, that that's even more important. So can you tell us your journey, how you became an entrepreneur? Because one, like I said off camera, with you I like for a few different reasons, but one of the reasons is that <laughs> you um you have a what we call like a traditional job. We'll talk about that. But you have a company as well. A lot of times people feel like it's one or the other. Mm-hmm. Right? And um it's not true. No. Like even Troy. Yeah. Troy Prime is example. an educator and he's an entrepreneur Nine as well. An entrepreneur. So, um, but the hardest part, I think, for most people is mindset. Like we could talk about mm-hmm. strategy and all that all day yeah. long, but the mindset is the most important thing. And it's very difficult for somebody to leave or to, to jump off the porch and to, to land into somewhere where it's kind of unknown. You don't mm-hmm. really know. It's like tight walking with no safety net. So yeah. how did you start your entrepreneur journey? Okay, that's a great, great question. So I like to tell folks that the nine to five is a fixed income. So you work um, eight hours, you get paid eight hours. You work 10 hours, you get paid eight hours. You work 12 hours, you get paid how many hours? (laughs) Eight, you eight, get paid eight, eight, eight hours. Math, <laughs> it's a fixed income. And it's one of those things that I wasn't taught growing up. So, like, I was taught that the definition of success was you go to high school and you get a diploma. You go to college, you get a degree, and then you go and get a good government job with benefits. That's, and then you retire, and that's the definition of success. That sounds about right. So, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> when I graduated from college, I did exactly what my mother told me to do. And I spent six years working for the federal federal government. Um, and I worked in counterintelligence, counter weapons of mass destruction, counterterrorism. I had a clearance, uh, top secret SCI, full scope polygraph, only 13,000 people in the nation have that clearance. But I would go to work every day at yeah. 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. I would run out as fast as I could. And during the time when I would be off of work, I would um, participate in endeavors that I started. And at that point, I didn't consider myself an entrepreneur. So so one of the um, endeavors that I participated in was Young and Powerful for Obama, which I was telling you about. And this was an initiative that galvanized young black professionals across the country to raise money for then Senator Obama. This was prior and to in 2008? This was in 2008, okay. yeah, when he was Senator Obama. And it was young black professionals from six different cities. We would host fundraisers. The fundraisers would cost anywhere between 20 to $50. And we would donate 100% of the money to the campaign. Um, but before he was elected, we raised a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, wow. And when he was elected and became president, Barack Obama, my forever president, mm-hmm. <laughs> we hosted a collection of inaugural events. Um, Reverend Al Sharpton came. Uh, we had Jesse Jackson. He was there. Oprah. She drove by in the car. She waved. Oh, wow. That counts. <laughs> I that counts. Her to come. That the counts. wave counted. But I want to open to come in <laughs> one day. One day, I'm going to shake her hand. We all going to shake her hand. Yep. <laughs> But it was a great event. We raised another um, quarter of a million dollars. So it was about a half million dollars by the time everything was said and done. And the entire time, I was working 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I was working Young and Powerful for Obama from 6 p.m. to about 1 a.m. in the morning. But when everything ended, folks started saying, you know what? I mean, raising money for President Obama was great, but I was only interested in politics just because of him. Mm. And so folks began to really ask the question, like, what was next? And what came from that is a nonprofit that I started Capital Cause where I trained young black philanthropists to raise money for startup nonprofit organizations. And uh, we um, had 5,000 members. We raised about $60,000 and gave away $5,000 grants to these businesses. And still, throughout all of that, I did not consider myself yeah. an entrepreneur. What, what inspired you to take that route, right? You raised money for politics. Right. What, what said, you know what, young black entrepreneurs that's Yes, like? yes. So... It was a six year worker for the federal government. And as I was telling Rashad, my bosses switched up. Mm. And I was working for um, white men at that time. I switched up to a white woman and we sat down and she said to me that, um, you know, I don't don't think that you're qualified to do this work. And I was like, well, why don't you think I'm qualified? And she was like, because you don't have a PhD, you don't have a master's degree, you have a bachelor's degree, and here you are writing national security reports that the vice president of the United States are seeing. So I'm about to switch up your job responsibilities. And she changed my responsibilities from writing these reports to organizing travel for the office. So I would go to work at 9 a.m. Demoted. (laughs) If I get out at 5 p.m. and still get paid six figures, then this will be okay. Mm -hmm. But then 
three months later, she switched up my job responsibilities again. She was like, I just think organizing travel is too complicated for you, just like national security reports is too uh, complicated for you. So now you're going to be printing badges for people in the office when non-secure people come and visit. And so I was like, okay, well, am I still going to be getting paid like six figures? I'll work from 9 a.m. I'll leave at 5 p.m. And so did that for three months. And then three months later, she came back and she was like making badges was <laughs> also too complicated for me and above my pay grade. And she asked me to take my chair and follow her down a hallway. And we stopped outside of a bathroom. Oh, like literally take the chair? Take the chair, had wheels on it. We was walking. She was tipping. I was tipping with my chair. I was like, oh, Lord, where are we going? And we ended up outside of a bathroom. And she said, well, I want you to sit down. And for every non-clear person that comes in, it'll be your job to buzz them in and out of the bathroom oh, wow. and I remember asking myself and asking her am I still going to get paid six figures but at that point <laughs> like, <laughs> your question never changed <laughs> never changed because I was there 9 a.m 5 p.m I was walking out the door but I asked myself like yeah it was great being paid six figures but you know work to me meant more than that like the value that I was creating outside right. of work raising money for Obama helping young black philanthropists give back that was the work that was really fulfilling and coming to work every day and sitting outside of the bathroom watching people well I wasn't watch people do their business but they were going in I watching the door when they were going in and out to do their business but so after about two weeks, I called up my mom and I was like, mom, like, I can't do this anymore. I need to quit my job. And she was like, do you have anything saved up? At that point, I had about three months worth of savings. And she was like, well, baby, I think you should have another job lined up. And I was like, I don't think I can do it. Like, I can't come in here every single day and open this door for people. Can't be the whole yeah, there, exactly. And she was like, well, if you want to quit, baby, like, I got you. And I remember quitting my job. Like, I quit my job and I was so excited. Have y'all ever quit a job before? You quit a job? No. No, you quit a job? I did, I did quit a job. How'd you feel? Um, it was great. Yeah, was I mean, great. I felt excellent. Like, yeah. I went running out there. I was like, oh, my God, I am so free. Like, no more nine to five, right? Yeah. But then Friday hit. <laughs> it was like the first time that I wasn't getting paid. I was telling Rashad, I called up unemployment. I was like, I guess I better get on this unemployment, get this check. I remember talking to the lady. And I was like, yeah, I quit my job. And I heard that y'all, like, pay 50% of your paycheck. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, how do I submit this paperwork? And she was like, you said you quit. Mm. And I was like, yeah. I quit and she was like yeah you don't get unemployment when you quit your job language is so, <laughs> yes so I was like did I say I quit like what happened was <laughs> my bad <laughs> right I Oops. got fired and so she was like yeah there's no unemployment for you and if there was you wouldn't be getting 50 percent of your paycheck so I was unemployed for six weeks and during those six weeks a woman who worked with me with Young and Powerful for Obama called me and she was like I have a job and the job is launching a national entrepreneurship initiative where you would teach African-American undergraduate students how to start a business before they graduate from school, especially since a black undergraduate student's um, college degree is equivalent to a white person's high school diploma. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, about what? A uh, um, black college degree is equivalent to a the, white high school diploma. Yeah. Yes, a black person's college degree is equivalent to a white person's high school diploma, which means that a black person can go to the same high school as a white person, go to the same college as a white person, and apply for the same job as a white person. But when they get hired, their pay is separate and unequal. Right. So, Yeah, I, I think I read a statistic somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. It was like a uh, middle class black family is equivalent to a poor white family. A poor white family, yeah. yeah. And black women especially, I mean, black people in general, our parents teach us to work twice as hard, to be twice as smart, to go into work and be twice as exceptional, and somehow, some way, we'll be the same as a white person. At the end of the day, black women especially will lose $840,000 over their working career, not because they're not smart, intelligent, or well-equipped to do the job, but simply because they're black and they're women. Mm. So black women graduate college at the at the fastest rate, at the highest rate out of any ethnic group? I, I, I I think that's what analysts say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're not paid, obviously, at the same level. They're not paid. And I think that that's why it's no question why black women are the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs. Like, yeah. I like to tell people that... Like, I don't think that black people are starting businesses because they want to be the next black Bill Gates. Love Beyonce, but the next black Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs or the next Mark Zuckerberg. They're starting businesses because they want to be economically free. Right. They want to be able to pay themselves what their companies refuse to pay them despite being qualified. Yeah. For them, that represents economic freedom and economic liberation. We, we had a, a guest who actually was talking about that, that exact topic, and they were saying, even with that, the entrepreneurism, getting uh, loans to start venture capital venture, oh, it was so black loans, right? black women are starting businesses at the fastest rate mm -hmm. but they get venture capital at the smallest rate right um out of any ethnic group gender group in america so it's a 
doesn't really make sense if you think about it because it's like you would figure more entrepreneurs you would get at least some sort of venture capital that's what venture capital is they lend money mm-hmm. to entrepreneurs but yeah. they get the least amount of funding from venture capital I think what's interesting is that black people need to have a more dynamic conversation around funding and so I think when it comes to VC that percentage is absolutely true but that's not the only type of business that black people are starting is an innovation driven enterprises which is what that is the type of businesses that qualify for venture capital there are two types of businesses that you can start. There's a SME and there's the IDE. There's a small, medium-sized enterprise where you can raise a friends and family round. You can go on to Razu if you're starting a nonprofit. If you're starting a what's, for-profit. What's Razu? Razu is a crowdfunding platform um, mm. for 501c3 nonprofit organizations where you can invite your friends to go on and donate. The only way that you can qualify to get on Razu is if you have an IRS designation. If you have a for-profit or let's say you're a solo uh, sole proprietor, which means that you do business as yourself, you can go on to Indiegogo, you can go on to what a lot of people think is an unpopular site, but GoFundMe, and you can do the same thing. You can ask your friends and family, essentially to invest in your business idea or to contribute towards your business idea. But for a small, medium-sized enterprise, in addition to doing crowdfunding, you can also do bank loans, and you can also fund your own business. That's fundamentally different than an IDE, an innovation-driven enterprise, where you're essentially going into debt by soliciting, yes, angel investors investment and also venture capital and those people are betting on you to serve a global market while small medium-sized enterprises serve a small or, or regional market so those are your nail salons those are your hair hairstylists those are your local coffee shops so all right that's interesting what's the what's it called the ib ide so that is an innovation driven enterprise so, uh, and a SME, which is a small or medium-sized enterprise okay so do you think that that's a that's an issue though with um Black community as a whole, where I see most businesses and the business ideas are small. The problem with small business is that, for the most part, they stay small, and you can't scale it. They don't really make that much. Most majority of business owners don't make money. Mm-hmm. Like we know that. Like the average employee makes more than a business owner, like per average. One of the reasons is that most businesses are small, very small, right? Like mm-hmm. one person. Mm-hmm. So like the grocery store well not the grocery stores but the the delis the bodegas if we was in new york the mm-hmm. bodegas the um is that bar- a corner store bodega yeah, 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 okay yeah, yeah that's right. a corner store okay. I'm, um, I'm a southern girl from virginia yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> it's only bodega what the um the barber shops the, yeah. the local restaurants do you think that that's an issue with black entrepreneurship that it's always a lot of times not on a bigger global vision it's more on a community-based small vision i think it's important to know the data so currently there are 2.56 million black entrepreneurs but only 110,000 of them have the capacity to employ at least one person now what you're speaking about is probably the 2.4 million people who can't right the 110,000 black entrepreneurs who are employers employ less than a million people but there are 18.5 million black people in the workforce (laughs) <laughs> that means that a majority of black people work for somebody, somebody who don't look like them, yep. which means tomorrow, if those employers were to come in and fire every single black person on the back on the ba- on the payroll, those black folks would be what? Unemployed. Unemployed. Yeah, and SOL. <laughs> so, oh, right, they would be SOL and they would be unemployed. So Black Upstart, I'm glad you're talking about this. What we do is we teach black entrepreneurs not just how to start a business, but how to start a business that can create a job so they don't have to go begging other people to do for them what they're capable of doing for themselves. Now for black entrepreneurs, the average black entrepreneur grosses less than six figures in revenue, which means that a lot of black entrepreneurs are starting businesses and their lifestyle businesses, which means that they're just essentially hustling. Mm-hmm. And what a hustle does is they wake up every single day and they try to get money while an entrepreneur wakes up every day and what they're doing is they're doing business they're creating systems and processes so that when their business scales other people can work for their business outside of just them so I think that there's a difference between the barbershop owner who probably has employees the coffee shop owner even if it's just them they employ themselves and the person on the side of the street who's hustling and trying to sell to every single person that walks by them right I think it's important for black people to realize the money that exists in our communities. So when I read the statistic about black entrepreneurs grossing fewer than six figures, I also read statistics about Asian entrepreneurs and white entrepreneurs and Native American entrepreneurs, and all of them gross more than six figures. In fact, Asian entrepreneurs have less 
entrepreneurs than black folks, but they gross double the amount of revenue. Why? Because when you look at the businesses that they start, mm -hmm. they start businesses in their own communities and then they come, then they come over to the black communities yeah. and start businesses. Yeah. So people always ask me like, okay, Kezia, what type of business would you start if somebody gave you a million dollars? And I always tell them that I would start a Chinese food delivery service. <laughs> and they're like, well, can you fry rice? Oh, no, I can't fry rice. Can you fry wonton? No, I can't fry wonton. In fact, I can't cook, which is probably why I'm not married. So like if anybody on the podcast, y'all want to play like matchmaker like i'm down for it <laughs> but, alumni but, listening. Exactly. so but when we go into a beauty supply store and a person on the other end of the counter is selling you hair grease and do rag and a good remy track and they don't look like you we don't think twice about it but people will laugh once twice a black woman selling fried rice and a wine time the reason why asian entrepreneurs are able to gross over six figures and employ them is because they're not only getting money in their own community but they are capitalizing off of the 1.3 trillion dollars that black people are spending every single day and so what i like to tell black entrepreneurs is that you have to look at what we're currently spending our money on mm -hmm. every single year the nielsen consumer index report publishes how black people spend their money the top five things are refrigerated drinks dried vegetables ethnic care care goods and supplies um contraceptives is one diapers is another one laundry detergent i know that y'all know about true that's a black owned laundry detergent company but when you look at the top five businesses that black people normally start it is admin services waste remediation third is other so that's like an amalgamation maybe like a compilation of many different businesses and what you don't see is alignment but when you look at the types of businesses that other entrepreneurs start, they are prevalent on the list where our dollars are being spent. Mm. Black people's, again, $1.3 trillion is not a blank check for other communities to sign. So real quick, you said um, that you train entrepreneurs. Obviously, I'm thinking through a curriculum one, but you also do a hands-on approach. What does that look like? Okay, so for the Black Upstar curriculum, uh, we host a six-day pop-up school, um, and it happens over three weeks and six days. And during that six days, we teach uh, the ideation process, the minimum viable product creation, business canvas development, and in the end, we teach them how to pitch. Mm. Yeah, so that's what we do with Black Upstart. We start with crowdfunding, and I know we had just had a conversation about crowdfunding, yeah. um, but we teach them essentially how to turn their contacts into capital. Um, contacts yeah. into capital. Contacts into like capital. That. So it starts with that before we even see them on the first day of class. So, and how many teachers? Is it just you or is it a team? No, so there is faculty. Um, and one of the things that I love about Black Upstart that I definitely should mention is we always teach in a black environment. So like right now, you all are in Southeast DC mm -hmm. and we started off in the Microsoft Innovation Center, which is located on St. Elizabeth's East Campus in Southeast and DC, they say South, like with an F. South. South. So got it, got it. <laughs> we have black faculty. So we have one faculty come in every single day and they yeah. teach on a very specific topic. Um, we have contractors that come in and help with website development all black, black photographers, black videographers, and when they pitch, they pitch their innovation in the community. Mm -hmm. And so now you have black consumers connecting with black entrepreneurs, and for us, it's about recycling the black dollar. Dope. All right, dope, dope. So mm -hmm. the next segment, we're going to talk about some different ways that uh, people can get up and running and um, get, get into the game as far as entrepreneurship is concerned. All right, so we're going to talk about some actionable items and some, some systems uh, to help people out. Uh, all right, so the audiation process? Mm -hmm, the ideation process. Ideation process. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Absolutely. So uh, we teach the ideation process. And it's a six-step process that teaches new small business entrepreneurs how to launch their enterprise in less than 30 days and with um, less than $1,000 in startup capital. So the first step is your problem statement. So please note that it's not a business idea. Okay. Problem statement. Problem statement. What type of problem are you trying to solve and for whom? So for Black Upstart, it would be black entrepreneurs have a problem starting businesses that create jobs. Gotcha. Normally, entrepreneurs get hung up on the first process because they want to tell you about their idea. That's their baby. And so we say you need to divorce yourself from your idea, talk about your problem, and your problem should be broad enough so that there are several different solutions that can address that problem. Number two 
is called investigation. And what that is, is market research. And so with market research, what you do is you look at other companies that are solving that problem. And you look at a few things. You see if they're a SME, we talked about that earlier, a small, medium-sized enterprise or innovation-driven enterprise. Mm -hmm. You look and see if they have employees because you wanna know if the business has scaled. And you look and see if they have, um, if they sell products and services. After that, you list five things that you like about that company and five things that you would change. And each of that, each of those items on that list should address the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, when you move on to step three, which is called the idea expression, you use the five things that you would change to create your unfair competitive advantage. So for Black Upstart, we looked at other businesses that were training entrepreneurs, and we realized that businesses weren't really saying that I want to train black entrepreneurs. They were dressing it up in coded language, like we want to help people of color. We want to help minorities. Are you disadvantaged? Come over here. Let me teach you how to start a business. So like, we knew that our unfair competitive advantage would be that we would explicitly state that we would train black entrepreneurs and this would be a 100% black experience. So for number three, again, you put your unfair competitive advantage in there and you say, I sell this to this particular person and say how it's different. It should be one sentence. Usually when you talk to an entrepreneur and you ask them about their business, they're going to tell you a whole book, all right? Because it's their baby. Um, but if you can't say it in a sentence, if it can't be like your elevator pitch, Elev elevator elevator pitch that is a, it's a sentence, then it's too long. Also, if you get to step number three and your business idea hasn't shifted or changed or you don't have better understanding on why you're doing business and in that way, then that means that you have to start over because you never got a divorce. So... Step number four is your customer demographic. And for a customer demographic, you're gonna list out 20 different descriptors about the person who is looking for a solution to that problem. And that looks like how old are they? How much money do they make? What is their race? What is their gender? Who do they follow on social media? Where do they currently work? Because you cannot make the assumption that they're looking for your new business idea, which doesn't exist yet. You call, these mm -hmm. questions are formatted already? Oh, for these are all answer? lists, yeah. yeah okay. And then number five is your user persona. You take all of those descriptors and you tell a story. So like Lakeisha is 26 and she works at Booz Allen Hamilton and she makes 62 thousand dollars so you tell a story and then last is your innovation and an innovation is something that is new original important that you can sell to other people for profit and it should be an MVP which is a minimum viable product creation what can you make with a minimum amount of resources that people can actually pay you for okay mm -hmm. you need to be able to make it with a thousand dollars you need to be able to launch it in 30 days and the reason why we set that parameter is because entrepreneurs dream big so you might be like what i want is a nail salon but perhaps all you can afford is a pop-up shop where people come and you do their nails on a Saturday at a community center that you've rented and that costs you $200 just to pop up and $300 for supplies. Mm -hmm. The reason why I say that is because once you get small, right? Once you learn how to use what you have, start where you are and do what you can, then you learn how to start agile. So that's hmm. the six step ideation process. There you have it. That was detailed. Yes, a lot of, <laughs> very detailed. A lot of and the jewelry. other thing that I want to say with the entrepreneurs, sometimes people don't define entrepreneurs, but an entrepreneur is someone who starts a business that has the chance of two things. That's profit and success. Yeah. We like to say that with Black Upstart, that if you're selling a product or a service that nobody wants to buy, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. Difference. Mm. How many, how many entrepreneurs are you looking for? How many do you guys take? Like, is it per year? How do y'all do it? Is so it it's, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, answer. I'm okay. Okay. No, now I was going to say, is there money that's <laughs> allocated uh, for the amount of business you can, or entrepreneurs that you can take? So it's competitive. Okay. We accept between uh, 10 to 15 people per class. Mm -hmm. We get about 200 applications for each class. When we first started, it was tuition based. And so we would train our entrepreneurs to raise their tuition, which was $500 per person. The average uh, entrepreneur would raise anywhere between 700 to $1,000. And every dollar that they raised above their tuition, they kept and used to make their minimum viable product creation. Um, but then as the business matured, we partnered with CDFIs. So those those are community development financial institutions. So in North Carolina, we work with Carolina Small Business Development Fund. And what happens is they actually Can cover- Can you say that acronym one more time? Um, CDFI, okay. so that's a community development financial institution, and they take bets on entrepreneurs that banks won't. So if you haven't made your first sale, they're more willing to, to 
make a $5,000 loan to you and take that risk and the government backs them in the event that you default on the loan. Okay. So I say that to say that we partner with CDFIs and they cover the cost of tuition and in exchange for that, entrepreneurs get free education and they pipeline into funding opportunities. So with, CD, with Carolina Small Business Development Fund, every single entrepreneur graduated with access to $50,000 in funding to start their business. Hmm. So, all right, that's crazy. So once they started with the 50,000, then what? Because now it's like you have the money, but you have to actually do it. Because it's one thing to actually research and have all the information, mm -hmm. and, but execution is always the most important thing. So like, as far as, is that part of the coaching? Like for people, like the execution, once you've reached the, the point where you're actually, okay, I have my, my uh, MVP, I have... Um, all of the my elevator pitch, everything that you just outlined, I have mm -hmm. that, I have mm -hmm. it. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. My business plan mm -hmm. is perfect. Now what? Like, I mean, like, <laughs> what's the execution part of it? And so, I think that's a really good question. Our CDFIs work with the entrepreneurs over a year to scale their business. And so, you know, we talked about business card entrepreneurs or people running around here all the time talking about I got a business, I got a business. All they got is a business card. So, <laughs> with them, they qualify for up to fifty thousand dollars in capital. But first, they do have to show proof of concept, and that's where that six step innovation comes in. We talked about how the boot camp ends the boot camp ends with a graduation and that graduation is not your traditional pitch competition like it's not you stand up there you tell people your idea and then there is a winner because that's not the way business it's works <laughs> right it's not shark tank <laughs> it's not two or three people decide that your business is viable and all of a sudden you win right. no you know your business is viable when you're making sales and so how our graduation day works is entrepreneurs bring their innovations to the graduation and people walk around and they give them real-time feed forward on their innovation and they respond to if they want to if they like the innovation by actually buying it and so they already have an MVP that the CDFI helps them position in the marketplace and they monitor their sales over the year and as their business grows then their access to funding does as well so as their business grows right mm -hmm. is there still a role that uh, black upstart plays as the, the business takes off so that's a good question because we talked about our businesses having events right on yeah. the same yeah, day yeah, yeah. so we're now launching skillhouse you and skillhouse you is an opportunity for entrepreneurs and also wealth creators as well to get additional training after that right so like launching the starting point is always really exciting when somebody first buys your stuff i'm sure y'all remember when somebody bought y'all's cute hoodies <laughs> and they got your first little <laughs> cash app or whatever y'all use like yeah i gotta sell you know but staying <laughs> in business right is a lot harder than that and so for black upstart and through skillhouse you what we're doing is we're teaching people like how do you read a cash flow statement like how do you engage an accountant right. if you can't afford an accountant how do you use Quicken loans you know what are those very specific skills that you need like what is an NDA what is a non-compete you know and when you're looking for visibility like how do you market when you don't have a budget and I think sometimes we do focus our conversation so much on starting that we don't get to the other side of the conversation is mm -hmm. how do you scale past just you so um, business plans do you do business plans we don't we do business canvases Okay. What's the, what's the cuz I a lot a lot a lot of people have asked us can you cover business planning or earn your leisure cuz like each, each week we cover a different topic. Mm -hmm. And we haven't covered business plans. But what you just laid out kind of sounds like a business plan. Mm -hmm. So, what's a business canvas? So, ideation process actually mirrors a lot of what you'll find in a business canvas. That is a one-page document that asks a lot of the same questions that you see on a business plan. So, it's going to ask you like what is your value proposition and who is your customer segment and what are your cost structures? It's going to ask you what are your key partnerships, what are your key relationships, but it's all on one page and it challenges you to think through some of the critical components of your business so that you can start up in a lean way and I'm sure y'all probably heard the terminology like lean startup right like how do you start get proof of concept and get to the point where you actually want to commit the time to write a 50 or 60 page business plan the problem with most entrepreneurs is they'll write 50 or 60 pages then they'll get started and they'll try to sell something and nobody will buy it and they'll think they have to write another business plan all over again the business canvas being one page and asking those critical questions just on one sheet of paper allows for people People to get to testing a lot quicker so that's what we teach okay so what about um obstacles the entrepreneurs face can we talk about some mm -hmm. the biggest one is funding that's the biggest one right 
What, I wouldn't say that's the biggest one. What would you say the biggest one is? I think the biggest obstacle facing black entrepreneurs is trying to succeed in business as a white person. What is, what's that mean? Yeah. So Let's get into that. Beyonce, <laughs> Beyonce rapping about like, I might just be the next black Bill Gates in the making. That was bars, y'all. Like, yes, 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 me yes. when I said that. Shout out to Queen Bee. <laughs> but the, I love her. I love her. Yeah. However, I think that that's erroneous. Like, I, I do a lot of work in Atlanta. And there was one particular experience that I had where I ran into a room. I really did run into the room because I'm a type A personality. And <laughs> there was another person running into the room, too, the facilitator. And he was asking the kids, like, who wants to be the next Bob Bill Gates? Who wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg? Who wants to be the next um, Steve Jobs? And all the kids were really excited because it was like a coding a free coding camp mm -hmm. and i was excited too i was like oh my gosh this is so great me. everybody's gonna be a bill <laughs> gates but then i realized that the facilitator was lying to the children because no matter how hard they tried they could never grow up one to be white two to be a white male three to be a white male benefiting from privilege and so the more i reflected on it the more i realized that we just don't have to teach white male privilege or the white entrepreneurial bl the blueprint that there is a black entrepreneurial blueprint right so like in silicon valley i think no one ever talks about the guy who invented um the predecessor to the nintendo which is a model uh F gaming system, mm -hmm. right? He dined as equals with Steve Jobs. No one talks about how Mary McCoy Bethune raised money to start her business, which was selling meat pies to the mine workers down the street. She started with a one room schoolhouse before she got to Bethune Cookman University. More contemporary examples like Issa Rae. People want to talk about how she's on HBO now with Insecure. But Awkward Black Girl was funded by a part of her salary and fundraising on YouTube where she introduced yeah. her series for free. So I think for black entrepreneurs, we have to learn how our predecessors did it without the benefit of white venture capital dollars or without the benefit of banks allocating us money. One other example, because I'm from Richmond, Maggie L. Walker started, well, she was the first woman at that, not black woman, but the first woman to charter a bank she funded that bank with charitable contributions. Do you know how many black people go to a charity every single Sunday, which is the church? Mm. Those are 501c3s. A 501c3 funded a for-profit bank. So I'm saying if we could study history, I think that we would be able to figure out better ways to be successful. We got to study it and highlight it. Because um, yes. a lot of times, um, especially when in school, right, when, they, when U.S. history is taught, yes. this is definitely omitted. 100%. 1,000%, right? Yeah. So, Highlighting it, understanding it, and studying it. And, and now that we have access to the internet and we have access to social media where these mm -hmm. stories can be highlighted, yes. you know, the future generations, there will be different stories now, I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or I think there will be remembering of the stories that have been untold. We're creating one right now. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Look at us. Look at history. Yes. Okay. So what would you say some other, some other obstacles are outside of that? Outside of that, I mean, you said funding, and I agree with that. I just okay. That was one. <laughs> He's like, we gonna bring it's number two for sure. We gonna say it's funding. Coming. So <laughs> funding was coming. Um, we talked earlier about the difference between a hustler and an entrepreneur. I think that that's important. I think the other thing is is that I think that people get caught up on this whole thing about were you born an entrepreneur or can you become an entrepreneur? You know, most people are like, I was born this way. I woke up like this, right? But no, <laughs> I think entrepreneur can absolutely be taught. You talked about us living in an information economy. Like we are fortunate to live in a time period where information is basically at your fingertips. So like what I like to tell people who want to start a business and people who want to create wealth is don't swim in an ocean of knowledge and drown in ignorance. Mm. So that's important. Um, the last thing I think that I would say is I don't think that you have to be the smartest person in the room <laughs> to be a great entrepreneur. So people normally think you have to have a PhD. You know, we talked about that when we first got started or, yeah. you know, they think that you have to be a straight A student. Like I graduated from high school with like a 2.3 GPA. Um, I wasn't the brightest student, but I was motivated and I was committed. And I thought that, you know, with me, if I could try hard enough, you know, if I, if I could really commit myself to a passion, then I could, you know, I could overcome the obstacle. Um, just one quick story, I'm a story teller. Um, gosh, I'm thinking about his name. Okay, I'm not gonna tell that story. <laughs> 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 What's the guy, hold on, I'm gonna tell you. Who's the guy who had the pink, y'all ain't never had a perm in your head. You know nah, the perm with the nah. pink box? What's his name? 
Never God did forget a perm. It's come to never me. did a perm. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, think Shadi did either. He told me there was never no. <laughs> no, nah, we just okay. actually covered the, the, okay. the, the industry in the. Yeah, we just did that whole okay. episode. On <laughs> that. No, no, Shout no. Shout out to Wade the Barber, man. Wade the Oh, he had a perm? No, he no, had no, the man. You got the man unit? Oh. Oh, oh yeah, the where they weave. put like the stuff yeah. on the okay, yeah, yeah I saw yeah. that. Yeah. Man weaves are big. Man weaves are big. <laughs> All right, so in the last segment we're gonna talk about some financial literacy stuff and things that um everyday people can use in their day to day life to make better financial decisions and just become more knowledgeable all the way around. All right, so now we want to talk about uh, UNCF, but first let's talk about some financial uh, <coughs> literacy topics because I know it's something that you're you're passionate about, especially like on social media, Instagram and stuff like that. So um all right. You said that you talk about making smart decisions a lot, like mindset, budgeting. Um, I see you, 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 you speak about that a lot. Can you talk about that, the importance of it? Yeah, it's important. Um, I'm passionate about entrepreneurship, and we were just talking about that. Like, I, I really think that black people should consider entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship means that you can be entrepreneurial at your job. But I don't think that every black person should be an entrepreneur, though I think that every black person should be an owner of assets and so on instagram you're right with professor keys i talk a lot lot about how people can be owner of assets because i do think that if you can multiply your streams of income you can achieve the same type of economic freedom that i believe the entrepreneurship provides so like what does that mean like multiply like what, multiply what kind of ownership your streams of income like no so, like, like you said like everybody can be an owner like an owner of a house can, owner of, of assets. assets yeah mm-hmm. owner of assets and assets i think you can talk about multiple assets like you can yes own your home stocks. you can own stocks you can own bonds you can invest in your 401k so like that type of ownership okay so mm-hmm. at least because you said that one, <laughs> one of the things you're really passionate about is the 401k yes so why are you passionate about 401k so <laughs> <laughs> When I was going to get that good government job. <laughs> so, like, it all comes actually, back to the right, government always job. Goes always. Back to government. Actually, my very first job was as a receptionist. Okay. So, um, and that was where I got a good government job. And I remember when I first got my first paycheck, my mom was like, well, did you invest in your 401k? And I was like, well, what's that? And she was like, retirement. I was like, mom, like, I think mom, about that. 21. Like, well, I'm, not, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to go to happy hour. And she was like, <laughs> you better happy hour that 401k. So like, I mean, at least you had somebody saying that to you. Yes, yes, and I'm I'm very grateful for that because people ask me sometimes like, what did I learn about financial literacy? And I really learned it from my mother before I started teaching it to myself. And she was like, the earlier you start investing in your 401k, the better. And she was like, and it's going to be difficult if you're like actually taking your money and investing it. Talk to your employer and ask them about their retirement plan. And usually they deduct it from your check Mm -hmm. (laughs) before you even see it posted in your direct deposit. And she challenged me to also ask them about matching. So I didn't even know what that meant, but she was like, go ask them about matching. And at that time, my employer was matching 6%. So Mm -hmm. 6% of my salary, that's what that means. Um, So I think at that point I was making $29,000. So whatever 6% of that was, every dollar I contributed up to that amount, they would match it. So my mom was like, that's free money do you like free money and i was like well i mean is that a rhetorical question (laughs) (laughs) yes i like free money three thousand dollars and then yeah it turns into six thousand dollars and so it just automated when i left that job i rolled it into an individual retirement account an ira and every single job that was one of the first questions that i asked do you have a retirement account how can i contribute and do you match and at my age now in my 30s um (laughs) i told him earlier i was 52 52 30s um i happened to look at my 401k earlier this year because my friend we were having a conversation he was like yeah i got like four hundred thousand dollars in my 401k i was like you got what i was like let me see what i got up in my ira my 401k at that point i was working at uncf so i had a 403b account the difference 401k is normally for for profits 403b is for nonprofit organizations they both do the same thing you invest in uh, 401ks and i had almost two hundred thousand dollars and i had not looked at it Mm. and so i was like you know what what if i started actively managing it like this was one of the best pieces of advice that my mom gave me and there's one statistic i want to share that's all motley fool that if you start 
um, investing $124 a week at the age of 25 into your retirement account, you can essentially retire with a million dollars, assuming a 6% return on your investment portfolio. And that means that at 24, you can be, or 25, you can be contributing the $127 a week. You can do that at 35, 46, 54, and that number never has to change in order to reach the $1 million mark. So with all these people on Instagram talking about like 2020 is smelling like a bunch of millionaires, <laughs> but if you ask them what their plan is, they don't have it. Like this could be like a really good opportunity for them to start. 2020 vision. Yes. So, 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 so you manage your own portfolio with the 401k? Like you pick, you pick your own funds? I don't, but I'm starting to really learn. I okay. didn't even know that that was an option. Like, like I, I know a guy that could help you. You know a guy? Yeah, Please yeah. We'll refer. talk after this. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. I got no, it. No, we'll talk after this. Don't worry I about it. I got it. Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> um, but one thing that I did learn is that you can select a, a target based account. Target, yeah, target yeah, this ba that's based on your age. And so, like, they basically invest um, the risk level according to so the younger you are, the riskier investments that you can make, and then the older you are, the less risk because you're getting closer to yeah. retirement. Yeah, the target the target day fund is always good. I think yeah. a good option because it's. it's it's like an autopilot. Yeah. Like, you know, the thing with retirement accounts is that mm -hmm. you want to be aggressive when you're young and conservative as you get older. Yeah. So a lot of times it's hard for people to kind of change it up themselves, manage yeah. their own portfolio because you yeah. got so much stuff going on. But right, the target right. date is like designed to right. become more conservative as you're closer to that target date right. of your retirement. I got a question for you. Okay. Do you know that guy I should be talking to? Well, I feel like you know him well. No. I don't know. I know. We got to talk about <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay. shout out to you and the friend yeah. who had the four hundred thousand in his four one k. Yeah, even having that type of conversation. Absolutely. Like, um, there's not many people uh, that I know um, outside of the group of Earn Your Leisure's team, but that have those type of conversations. Yeah. And a lot of times, people say you will go as far as your conversations take you. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So like, you need to tweet that. That was good. You can put that. Okay, I'll put that on my dad. I'm gonna give you credit. I'm gonna give you credit too. <laughs> <laughs> give you credit and and too. the four the four one k is not something that it's not the most sexy investment it's not right but it is practical it's very practical and i always tell people like you gotta put different assets away for different things Absolutely. so the 401k is for your retirement it shouldn't mm -hmm. be your only investment that not you have in life right but for a long-term retirement savings is mm -hmm. great especially like you said if they match that's free money mm -hmm. so always try if you can try to contribute at least up to the match yeah because that's that's pretty much free money right and the other thing that i didn't know until i started doing my research as well is that you can use some of the money in your retirement account for very specific purposes because if you withdraw early there will be the penalties but you can use like ten thousand dollars for a down payment on your first home mm -hmm. you can use ten thousand dollars of it for educational expenses oh. you can use another ten thousand if you have any emergency like health considerations that's thirty thousand dollars if you invest that much if it's in your portfolio that you can actually use and another thing with the 401k is a lot, it's a lot of flexibility with the 401k is that mm -hmm. you can borrow from it most yeah. of the time like up to 50% mm -hmm. up to 50,000 so yeah. but the good thing with the four I mean it's pros and cons obviously because you're borrowing mm -hmm. from your retirement but yeah. if you have no other place to access money right. most of the time most people like the most money that they have saved is in a 401k right so now you can borrow from that it's at a lower interest rate than you yes. went from a bank it's just like three four percent right so you're pretty much borrowing from yourself and you're paying back yourself right as opposed to taking a bank loan let's say of 10 percent right or t just using your credit card at 21 right 19 percent right you're borrowing at a much lower rate and right. you're borrowing from yourself so you're paying yourself back so it's a lot of flexibility yeah that people don't fully un i think a lot of time people these are just basic general investments but it's like this is what's gonna for the average American, right. right? This is gonna make you a millionaire. Absolutely. Your house, a 401k, you, like you said, most people aren't gonna start a business. Right. We hope that everybody does, but right. it's just not realistic, not right? Realistic. Most mm -hmm. people are not gonna have a million different exotic investments and right. make a million dollars off Bitcoin. It's just not gonna happen. Right, right. But it's very practical to have a million dollars in your retirement or home, stuff like this. So I think like these are conversations that outside of the really exciting, sexy stuff. Mm -hmm. We got to have these conversations as we well, have to. for sure, for mm -hmm. sure. So I saw, I saw um, something that you you had put. Uh, I think it was yesterday, where you said that. Um, I guess our relationship had ended because um, <laughs> over over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you put it on Instagram, so it is. What you it know, we're watching everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. we're watching everything. Yeah. <laughs> so so the reason so it's holiday time. Oh, it's holiday boy. time. It's holiday mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> People have to be responsible with their spending, yeah, they right? Got to. And you got to think about generational wealth Men over, and women. over Men short and women. term, <laughs> over short term gratification. So, um, how you feel about that? About the guy? 
Well, and not the guy. Not the guy. <laughs> just, just in general, just the whole general. Can, can, can you give us a, a, a paraphrased version of what happened? Cause maybe yeah, I don't know yeah. I, I was I was dating this guy. Um, <laughs> we went out for a couple months, and um, he asked me to buy him some really expensive shoes for his birthday. In fact, eight hundred. What kind of shoes? Balmain. 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 <laughs> Balmain shoes. I mean, if you gotta ask, you. I just I mean like. Why not? I don't know. Why not? Like it, it only been like two <laughs> months, maybe two in a possible month. Do you love me? Like I mean, like do I love him? He gone. <laughs> no, but I was like, uh, like I'm he said, like, that was, a, that was, like, the test. Like, that was the test. Like, do you love me? Really like, not that much. Not that <laughs> so, like, <laughs> not that so, and the conversation came after I had just told him that I had paid off all of my debt. Like, oh. credit card, car, student loan. So, like, we were celebrating. Yeah. And he was like, well, now that your credit card is, like, on zero dollar balance, like, you can afford these shoes. Yeah, the money's like, freed up. <laughs> no, bro. Like, <laughs> my interest rate, you just said, was double That's digits. Crazy. Are you about to make me put $800 back on it? So, he broke up with me <laughs> <laughs> and i actually think that was a good, good decision good i think you. that was a good decision good so yeah so for me it really is about being fiscally responsible and not buying liabilities and masking it as an asset like that shoe is not going to in my opinion i don't know much about shoes but i don't think it's going to appreciate in value uh, not that you know, so no, 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 no. <laughs> right I'm the conversation would have turned no, out that, differently yeah, means, no. right so high, high cost um value uh mm -hmm. very low return no it's yeah. emotions a lot yeah. of times too is yeah. people have to be you have to think long term yeah obviously but you can't get caught up in short term gratification short term gratification, short -term gratification. yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I see you talking about that like, and also I see you talking about a lot like even with like relationships I think that's important I like when you say that like how to date a boss and, like I see you post a lot about relationships and it's like mm -hmm. a, that's a big component of wealth building yeah right mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's like a lot of times like who you're with will dictate like or at least have a part to play in how you think mm -hmm. right because it's like peer pressure like right. if you're around somebody that's constantly telling you like we need to get this assets we need to do this right you're going to automatically like if you're around your friends are saying that or if you're around somebody it's like let's just go to the mall let's go on right. this trip let's like go shopping, your mind's going to be on that as yeah. well right, right? so yeah. i what do you feel about that? Like I, 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 I said, you know, like I mean, I, I think he he definitely wants to watch my videos when he asked that question. <laughs> but like one of the things that I like saying is that we're not flexing with liabilities anymore. Like this running around with Gucci, like two weeks after you already was like, you know, hashtagging f Gucci. Mm. You know, like you know, it's not that that's not the new flex. And what I really love about this whole movement that Earn Your Leisure is doing, the Black Upstart is getting into, is that people are realizing that ask. ask Assets is the new flex. We do talk. I do talk a lot about relationships and the importance of breaking generational curses of poverty. I think sometimes we romanticize the struggle. Like we sit here, we talk about, oh, you was on started the from the bottom, babe. We came from started nothing. Started from the bottom, we but they don't want to get to the but we hear part, right? And I think that the person that you partner with definitely does have an influence on how you are going to live that life. When you get married to someone, when you're in relationship with someone, you begin sharing a lot of things with them and it's more than just emotions it can be finances too sure. when you start making those <laughs> when you start making those joint decisions together like buying a house you're gonna be talking about who has bad credit who doesn't have bad credit you know like when you're talking about hey we need to invest in a 401k so a percentage of my paycheck is already being you know contributed towards this your partner may be like well how come we can't go on vacation this year and so i think it's important for people to get on that same page yes with one another so no, it's important. It's, it's a conversation that we don't have a lot. Um, and yeah, we need to have like a whole episode on relationship. Yeah. I, no, um, somebody actually asked me, um, a good friend of mine was saying that, you know, we talked about credit, but what happens when your spouse doesn't have great credit and the pressure that- Or they ruin your credit. Or they ruin yours your because credit. they don't have it. You got right? a co-sign, a car uh, for them yeah, and all that? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and I think that those are like, <laughs> those are the That's conversations taxes. that you should be having in dating. I'm not married. I'm not in a relationship right yeah. now. But I have been very intentional about when I do, you know, meet someone that I'm interested in and we do go out. Yeah. Like on that first and second day, I'm asking like, what are you reading? Are like, you what asking, do you like, think? Yeah, yeah. What, what's your credit score? I mean, I think that that could be a question for the third day. <laughs> 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 the 
first and second date, I'm like, well, what are you interested in? Like, you know, it's payday, so <laughs> I just bought a read. Like, do you got a Robinhood account? You know, the person's looking at me cross-eyed. So very we subtle, might not very like subtle, right very subtle, very subtle. Like, like that, like that. Like that. What you mean? Like, you what know. About, oh yeah, I like that movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know, that's how I know exactly where the mindset is. There's a guy actually that I connected with um, who teaches about stocks, and we connected on the phone, and like literally for four hours we were talking about exchange traded funds, real estate investment trusts. Like he wow. was telling me how he wanted to like invest in housing. Like we were talking about like I didn't know. I just started repairing my own credit because I didn't know when you pay off all of your debt, <laughs> like that can drop yeah, your yeah, credit yeah, score. Yeah, like yeah. I literally closed my credit card oh. um, after I paid it off. And 30 days later when I got the notification that my credit had dropped, like at that point it was too late to reopen the card and I had that card for 12 years. He and I had that conversation about what it took to rebuild our credit. Like I think that we need to change how we start connecting with people, whether it's friends or whether it's the person who you're in a relationship with or trying to get in a relationship Yeah, with. conducting, not speaking, conducting. Yeah, I like conducting, that. Conducting, yeah. yeah. That's a fact. That's a, don't don't play it so. Don't do that. Don't play it so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel like there's a story behind that. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay. 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 Like I always say, po- positive peer pressure. Positive okay. peer pressure Absolutely. is something that we um we learned early on okay. as far as like even your your friends. Yeah. Right. It's like. We, we know negative peer pressure. Yeah. Obviously, everybody knows that. Right. But positive peer pressure is like if you're around people that's like doing well. Like if you're in a, a school and everybody's doing well, nobody wants to be the dumbest person in the mm-hmm. class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're going to naturally push yourself to not be the dumbest person in the class. Right. right? And that's positive peer pressure. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with finance. Like if you're around people that are making smart decisions, that's doing things, that's, mm-hmm. you know, buying real estate, you're not going to be the one slacker. You don't want right. to be that one you slacker. You want to yeah. have good credit. Like, your right. friends have good exactly. credit. So I think that these conversations are dope and it's really changing the narrative, especially in our community because for a long time, it's not, it wasn't, nobody was having these conversations. Right. No, nobody was having we these conversations. We got to start conducting better conversations. Absolutely. Well, that's, what, we that's, that's what, what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So, all right, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh my God. Our time is up. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. I had a Part lot of two. fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sure. How, so great. how can the people contact you? How can they get information on mm-hmm. Black Upstart? Any events you have coming up? What's, what's the deal? Yeah. So um, they can follow the Black Upstart. That's the T-H-E Black Upstart. Um, they can also follow me at Kezia M-W, K-E-Z-I-A-M-W. Um, we will be hosting um, boot camps across the nation in 2020 um, in six different markets. So North Carolina, Baltimore, Atlanta, New Orleans, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're going back to Johannesburg, um, South Africa, and we'll release the whole list of cities um, the first week of January. And each one of those experiences are sponsored by CDFIs. So we'd love to train up entrepreneurs and give you access to funding upon graduation. So All right, Dolby, we got we got collab sometime for we sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially sure. that in Johannesburg. South Africa. Yeah. That's a fact. Come on. That's you that. can get flued out. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Yeah, for sure. Conduct that conversation. <laughs> yes, conduct. That's the word of the day. I love it. Troy, some housekeeping items? Yeah, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. Y'all know that's our Proud to Pay program. We got some new members. Want to give them a shout out. Uh, Chris. Uh, Ken, Ricardo, and Cyrita. I hope I pronounced that right. They be killing you me. You didn't pronounce it right. I didn't? Yeah. How you know? Yeah, I'm Maybe. Just <laughs> yeah, nah, that, that happens a lot. They're like, yo, man, I love my shout out, but you, you, you left the letter out. I'm trying, y'all. Cyrita, if I, I mispronounced it, I love you still. Thank you for signing up for Earn Your Leisure. Um, uh, for Patreon, uh, that gives you access now to earnyourleisure.com. You know, if you're a tier four or five member, you have access to our, our new online school, man, Earn Your Leisure University. And, and Rashad has the merch on, so. That's, that's on its way, the new merch for Earning Leisure University. And um, obviously, I'm wearing the assets over liabilities. Um, it's hoodie season. It's cold in New York. It's cold in D.C., y'all. So uh, get you a hoodie. And um, keep supporting, man. We appreciate it. It allows us to do things like this, come to D.C. And, and touch base with some people who are doing some amazing things. Yeah, for sure. And once again, the merch, uh, EYL University, the, the new wave that we're on right now. It's a really, really dope platform. Maybe you could teach a class for us. We, what we I'd do, love to do it. Yeah, for sure. We, 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 do, we do three classes a week, and we have, like, Guest lecturers that we kind of rotate from our alumni. You're an alum. That's what we call our, our guests. Yeah, I graduated. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, EYL University is really really dope platform that we're really proud of. And uh, once again, DMV, thank you for the hospitality. Atlanta, we will see you guys soon. January 25th, uh, January 25th oh, 26th. Hey, That's a fact. You, hey, look. you put it in your calendar. Right now? Look, hold on. <laughs> put it in. Put it in. Right. Yeah, pop up, <laughs> man, for sure. So. 
And the book tip of this week is uh, the African American entre- African American entrepreneurship then and now. Um, so this whole conversation, well, the large majority of this conversation was about entrepreneurship. So um, this is something that we want to just keep encouraging people to become entrepreneurs, but not just come on, become entrepreneur, just to say you're an entrepreneur to win. Like you don't want to just play the game; you want to actually win. Yeah, and that's and what, help other people win too. Yeah, exactly. And that's what having yeah. a plan is about, and that's what having a strategy is about. So. That's what it's about. So once again, thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.